Welcome back to another episode of Revival Radio TV. I'm here with Robert Schlerner, and we're going to pick up where we were before. But one of my favorite people, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, she scared me when I first saw her. I didn't know what she was going to do. And who I'm talking about is Vicki Jameson. I'd never seen anybody sing a prophetic word or sing a man. Yes. <laughs> it was like, I'm like, what is this? So uh, let's talk about Vicki Jameson. Grew to love uh, Vicki's ministry yeah. and what she did. What an amazing woman. But I want to hear about Vicki Jameson. To those people that don't know. Vicki Jameson was, she was a part of the Word of Faith revival in the early hours of it. Right. And God gave her a ministry of healing that came out in song. She yeah. would sing the word of knowledges and the prayers over people. I saw her at the Maybe Center. Right. And uh, it is unusual. She, the first time I heard Vicki James was on the radio of Kenneth Hagin's show. She was singing uh, his theme song, I yeah. Only Believe. And that was where, and she would come to share an assembly during the Hagin things and be in the meetings. And I was a kid there, so we knew who right. she was. Then she began her ministry uh, and it began to take off the healings. And Brother Hagin uh, liked her and favored her in the ways that gave her a platform. And uh, she had a very strong healing ministry. And the new thing was, was the, the song part of it. She had a call she was working on. She wanted New England to be revived. So, so part of her ministry at one time was focusing on the New England part of America. She went on TV up there. She would do crusades and was making huge impacts. What happened with you? I have lung cancer. Cancer where? In my lungs. And it's crossed over. I sound so funny. Huh? You sound so <laughs> funny. But I couldn't take a deep breath when I got here. And now I can't. Come on, take oh, look. Take a deep one. Come on, we'll do it with you. <gasps> He's a healing presence. He's a healing God. We got you covered. Oh, Father, let your sweet love flow. Not a malignant cell can stand in this body. Not a malignant cell and no damage from the chemo, Lord. With his stripes, she's as healed as I am. We're not finished with our race. We're not finished with our course. See, when I'm finished, then I don't mind going. But I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. Now, she's not finished yet either. She's learning to walk backwards. <laughs> she's adding something new to her abilities. Oh, that joy is starting to well up inside you, isn't it? Yeah, there you go. Oh, my, the joy. Fill her, Lord. Fill, fill, fill. She needs a laugh a day. I love that. Only a little lady can do it that delicately. It's just... So I remember those things. She was a very kind lady. I felt that she could have taken Miss Kuhlman's place. Really? Why, she, why she had that tangible presence that goes with that gift. Right. And she had an elegance about her a powerful sweetness that, kept, yes, you know, that, that was there. And she was also unique in her own with the singing ability, which was, that made her a little different than everybody else. But it worked. Yeah, It wasn't a harsh, it was, you're being healed of this, or God's doing it, and, and sing a prophecy. It was, it, it blows your mind. I watch her on YouTube once in a while and think, I wish somebody could do that again. Because yeah. she could do a whole, a whole healing service singing. Yes. And, uh, and people got healed. So uh, she, um, she had some little, if you want to talk about all the whole thing, she had some tragedy toward the end of her life. My, uh, her last marriage was not good. Right. And there was controversy around that whole thing, and she died in the middle of that controversy. Um, I think the latter part of her life, uh, she, because of that marriage, it affected the ministry. This is one of the big problems we have in ministry in history and today, is people are marrying the wrong person. Uh, they're marrying because they like the way they look, or they like the same kind of music, you better find out, can you live with that kind of call? Yeah. Well, can you huge. be... That's a huge statement You know, right there. I see too much of this today, and I've seen it in history. You know, and uh, the older marriages of the 1700s, 1800s, early 1900s, were the kind of folks that the tenacity was in both of them. And they were able to survive the mission fields and things that were very difficult. So I'm jumping off of Vicky, but no, that's really good. And and I really, I, I, I there is some stuff out there on YouTube, and uh, you know, it's it's interesting to watch. I I have never. I, it's interesting you say the connection with um, Catherine Kuhlman because I really did 
see some of that. There was a tangible was present. presence yeah. in the room. Um, and my my first memory was back on the PTL club with Jim oh, Baker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was working there in the 70s, and she would come, and there would be like, I don't understand what's happening, you know, but something's happening. And mm. so it was a very, very interesting scene. She, had a, she was tuned into yeah. the spirit world in a way that most people were not. She knew how to cooperate real beautifully and elegantly. How is that tuning different than a William Branham tuning? Well, the difference would be the gifting and call placement would be right. the first difference, I would say. But you have to be able to tap into the work of the spirit, the sound, the ways that God does things and cooperate with the ways. Most of us only see the acts of God. Yeah. These guys and a few others begin to understand how God does and cooperates with them. And that's why they have such great give successes. Give us an example. An example of that. Um, you can take Or Roberts. I mean, Or Roberts tapped into that healing anointing, that power, and knew how to administrate that in a way where in the tent days, a huge percentage, a large percentage were healed instantly. Right. Not all, but a large percentage was. So to me, he, he tapped into that. He paid the price. Uh, if you study his life, about two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, and then he would go to his room and stay locked in his room until night meeting, praying, preparing, and he would not come out of that hotel room until he felt the power of God. So there was a working that he did with the Spirit, the waiting upon the Lord, listening, waiting. I'm not leaving this room until I feel. He goes, I don't want to sense. I have to know I have that power. And unless he had that knowing and he could feel it, he wouldn't leave the room. So there was ways that you cooperated, the price that he paid. Right. How many times did Oral Roberts read the New Testament through? How many times did he, do, you know, there's certain things you can look at that he began to learn the ways of how God worked yeah. uh, through the scriptures. And sometimes it's trial and error. When you first start in some things, you, the anointing comes and you do something and it lifts. That means don't do that again. Right. You know, just stop. But if it gets stronger or it works, then do that again and flow in it. Catherine Kuhlman, she did the same thing in every service for her whole life, yeah. and it worked. It did. So that, that's good. All right, let's move on. Uh, Hiram Bingham, you know, we've explored Hawaiian revivals on, on this program before, but I want you to kind of dive into Hiram Bingham. Well, the, the Hawaiian revival to me is, is a beautiful thing because you have two. You've got Hiram Bingham and Titus, I forget his last Cohen. name, who are the two voices. And to me, I put Betsy Stockton in the middle because of the unique thing of who she is. I have to tell you about this amazing woman. Her name is Betsy Stockton. You have to ask why this woman wants to go as a missionary halfway around the world just to minister to heathen people who might kill her. I was only 10 years old when Samuel Mills and Henry Abuku said missionaries were needed to go to Hawaii. Who knew it would be me sailing to the other side of the world? I ask you, imagine, not what you see or what is happening around you. Simply imagine. It was the start of the American missions and Betsy did not want to be left out. Yet people who were headed to the South Seas figured going to the Hawaiian Islands was a one-way trip to heaven by way of martyrdom. Some of them would even ship their belongings in a coffin. They were really putting everything on the line. How could this former slave create the first mission school in the Hawaiian Islands? How could she create a teacher training plan that would become adopted throughout the islands? The completely illiterate Hawaiian people would become 90% literate. What were they reading? The Bible. She never knew her father or even the date of her birth. The Lord was the only father she knew. She grew up in slavery. Her owner was the president of Princeton University. He homeschooled her and she read through his extensive library. Eventually, he freed her. She had a talent for learning languages. Henry Ibuku, before he passed, had written a book to teach the people to read. She learned Hebrew is very similar to the Hawaiian language. They had a printing press, she had the tools. The stage was set, 
they were ready to go. How do you go from slave to educator? On the ship sailing to Hawaii, I felt the salt water washing my skin, the waves of the ocean moving the deck. As the missionary sailing ship journeyed forward to Hawaii, I left my slavery identity behind me. I began to imagine what could be possible. She went on this journey, she talked, I don't know, took about six months to get to the Sandwich Islands. She wrote a diary, detailed it all, and so she went to the Sandwich Islands. She was the first single woman in America as a missionary to go overseas. Well, she goes overseas. She's very talented. You know, she was there with the Queen of Hawaii, and the Queen wanted her to teach her kids. And so others from the royal family, remember the royal family was uh, separated from what the regular people were. So she set up a school system for them. She started to educate them. And then because of favor and what she did with those people, she was allowed to introduce a whole school system to all the other kids in Hawaii at that time. So she set up a whole educational system in Hawaii but she had to come back early. But what she did became, you know, changed that culture of education in Hawaii. Three years of teaching the children to read the Bible in those schools. Can we number the converts who also found the Lord? In the next generation, every island would experience an awakening. Titus Cohen talked with each person in the islands. They attended Betsy's schools, yet even hearing Bible stories they each needed to have that personal, born-again experience. Titus got the credit, but Betsy planted the seeds. As Jesus says in John 4, 37, one sows and another reaps. Returning home, she founded the Witherspoon Street Church, founded schools in America and in Canada. Revival followed where she went. If we are in troubled times, will we do what Betsy did and put it all on the line? The church needs to be a haven, a place to comfort and to educate. Can our people read? We need to teach reading. Do they know the love of Jesus? They need that too. We need to learn how to be a family and stand together. This is important. I saw slavery. I lived to see it in. John Quincy Adams wrote in his diary, he said to Abraham Lincoln, we fight every year to end slavery. When I am gone, you must fight slavery until it is gone. Adams survived his assassin's attempt. Abraham Lincoln fulfilled his commission. He ended slavery, but he didn't survive his assassin. This is going to be my written history, my life. Freeing the mind can be a life-changing journey, or maybe seeing people find Jesus is the greater journey. Yet, when I am gone, it will be yours to imagine. What will we be able to write about you? No, she has several things going against her. Number one, <laughs> your color, your gender, and the time period of what, uh, 1700s, early 1800s. Yeah. So it's it's not, we're not even thinking ERA or women's right yeah. to vote. That's not even, <laughs> right. so, and plus the, the whole slave issue and that's going on. And so she has to work through all of that. So long story short with her, she she passes what I call the missionary sending test. One, are you saved? Do you really know Jesus? Because the missionary societies would do that. And then secondly, she um, passed the test. She's really called. And so they wanted to put her on uh, Bingham's team to go to the Sandwich Islands right. or the Hawaiian Islands. Yeah. And so they were concerned that they would view her as a servant or some type of slave factor when they wanted her to come as an equal. And they welcomed her, Bingham and the team welcomed her as an equal and kept her like that all through her time. Right. So you gotta salute her and salute that team for the first big step is if God sends Betsy, we'll receive her and she has a voice to speak her mind and advise and to, to yeah. you know, that's a big deal. It took them, what, 18,000 miles mm. to go from New England, America to the Hawaiian Islands that were called the Sandwich Islands after yeah. the Earl of Sandwich or someplace over there in England. And uh, the a Hawaiian uh, researcher, and I talked a while back, and he tells me the story that I'm still trying to document, that in the Hawaiian culture, 
there was what we would call an ancient prophecy. They had another word for it that one of the old chiefs had given a vision that he had saw or something like that from the great spirit kind of thing, that there would come people off of a boat carrying a black box. And, 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 and they said, when they come, believe them. They are good people. So this was hundreds of years, as it's been told. And so Bingham and the group come walking off the boat onto the shores of Hawaii, carrying their big black Bibles, the black boxes. Uh, and the people remember the legend of this, we call a prophetic word. And, um, and it begins to slowly open. They still gotta go through all the process of learning sure. and all that. But there's already a working inside of their culture because here comes the people with the black box. Ah. And so it opens there. And so that to me is a story that I'm, I, wanna, I want to prove a couple more source documents where I can go, yeah. boom. But it's a great story. It is to a me, great it sounds story. like something God When you read ancient civilizations, sometimes they'll, they'll say the great spirit of whatever told them, and it was the devil. Yeah. Once in a while you think, well, that really was the Lord. Yeah. And that was the Lord speaking <laughs> yeah. to these people. And I think if I can confirm this to be true with a couple more source documents, I think this is one of those positives that the God spoke in the way they understood. And he told that word and it echoed through the generations to when it came true, there was already a welcomeness or an awareness that this was coming. Wow. And so at this time, the revival in Hawaii becomes the largest Protestant church in the world. Mm. It's not in England. It's not in America. It's in the Hawaiian island, over 10,000 people. Wow. Becomes a member of the church. So it's the largest Protestant church in the world with the Hawaiian people. Here's what missionaries did back then. They had to go create the Bible. Right. So you go to a people, you go to learn the language, and there's no written language. You have to create the written language, then teach the people their own language before you can give them the scripture. Wow. Now, that's like, commitment. That, <laughs> and and it's called intelligence. Yeah. A side remark the people of the past sent their best to the mission field. Oh, that's true. Their best. Some of them went to college to be able to take that skill to those people. Yeah. Today, we don't have the same thing. It's almost like the leftovers get to go to the mission field. Right. Now, I don't want to be rude, but it feels like, folks, let's send the, the, the sharp couple yeah. to lead the, the missions of this church. Well, if they leave me, I'll lose my tithes and offerings. Well, you'll gain a nation. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, we've got to start thinking. And they sowed their best. These are educated, some of them wealthy families. And they gave themselves to remote, difficult disease Right. type of places. And so they came in there and they begin to preach and the, the, the language was what kind of opened the Hawaiian people to because for some reason that generation valued what we would call education. Yeah. So besides the scriptures, they created schools. And so I think at one time they had, a, had over 50,000 Hawaiians in their school systems around the islands. So these people didn't just come with you know, singing Amazing Grace. They came getting you saved and Christianity was first, but you, to make you a better life. Imagine this, a volcano erupts and destroys most of an island. It had happened before. What was different was this time we had a missionary and his church. Even though it was on the small Hawaiian island, it was the world's largest church with over 15,000 converts. So this volcano has erupted on Hilo and the lava is not moving slowly like you see on the main island of Hawaii. These lava flows are savagely destroying villages as far as 50 miles away. In places, it's 25 feet deep. Also, there are two lava flows, not just one big one. Now we come to the people. The pagan priests are living out every terrible vice and pushing that onto their people. So as the lava pours out, these heathen priests are demanding their pagan God, save us, save our homes and our villages. One by one, the lava flows right over these pagan homes and decimates their villages. Much of Hilo is covered with lava, and if these two flows merged, it would meet at the final standing village on the island. In this final village, there is a man. His name is Titus Cohen. One man, one missionary base, one village. Titus and his people watch. They wait. Will they lose everything? In one of the miracles that spawn missionary history, the lava flows are in sight now of the villagers. The Christians of this village call on the name of their God. 
Are the lava flows actually slowing? They are. Even slowing down, will the lava eventually overrun and destroy the village? From Titus Cohen's diary, we learned they silently watched. Then the lava flow ceased, only a few feet from the border of the village. Their homes, Christian mission, and even the entire village was spared. Even today, this is amazing. You know, Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. In the face of sheer power found in that name, lava ceased to flow. Titus Cohen is credited with the Hawaiian Islands awakening that took place from 1835 through 1840. Titus Cohen had accepted the Lord in a Charles Finney meeting in Boston and became a minister. He had learned from Finney how to have a revival. Finney's efficient, simple, yet gentler, kinder way of soul winning were revolutionary fresh ideas over earlier methods of soul winning. Titus Cohen carried Finney's ideas to the island of Hilo, Hawaii. He was said to not only take the success of Finney's revival, but reproduce it in Hawaii, but he also had the attitude that we should all have to let God bring forth a great harvest. The populace were still attending Betsy Stockton's island schools. Yet diaries say at Hilo, there were only about 23 people in that generation who were actually born again believers. You can hear a Bible story, you can listen to a preacher, but you still have to have that moment where you make Jesus your Lord. In fact, he writes to his colleagues there, when I came to the islands and before I could even use the Hawaiian language, I often felt as if I should burst with a strong desire to speak the word to the natives. And when my mouth was open to speak the love of Christ, I felt that the very cores of my heart were wrapped around my hearers and that some inward power was helping me to draw them in as the fisherman feels when the drawing in his net is filled with fish. There was a wave of the move of God to the islands and on the other side of the island, Missionary Lorenzo Lyons also saw many people accepting Christ. Their two stations combined, and they were responsible for over 3,000 of the almost 5,000 new members added to the church between 1837 and 1838. Cohen mastered the Hawaiian language, and after 1838, new member admissions averaged nearly 2,000 annually. Those closest to Cohen said his strong principle was love in action. Historian Gavin Dow said that love was the driving force in his life. He loved his wife, he loved Christ, and he loved his work. He said Titus Cohen worked to emulate in living form John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Cohen made a tour on foot throughout his district visiting each church member living within 100 miles of his station. He kept notes on each member as well for how he might better serve them. They would ask him to speak, then follow him weeping and begging for more teaching or another sermon. How could he say no? So as he walked, his group grew as well, walking with him to the next town so they could hear another message. Listen to what he wrote. Many listened with tears, and after the preaching, when I supposed they would return to their homes and give me rest, they remained and crowded around me so earnestly that I had no time to eat. And in places where I spent my nights, they filled the house to its entire capacity, leaving scores outside who could not enter. From dawn to midnight, they continued through his 30-day tour. He not only preached, but saw 20 schools and 1,200 students. Some sources say within the first year, his church numbered 15,000 members. By 10 a.m., when he went to breakfast, he already held three church services. He came back to Hilo from visiting his members to find a pile of building materials stacked up. What's that for, he asked. His local members explained he needed a bigger church building in the village so he could maybe hold fewer meetings in a day. Still, at least twice, the meetings had to be moved outdoors to accommodate the 10,000 members who attended. What was so precious about the Hawaiian people was how they gave themselves to prayer. On Malachi, 
Reverend Harvey Hitchcock noted that a number were in the habit of rising an hour before light and resorting to the schoolhouse to pray for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Entire choruses of people prayed out loud together, holding nothing back. Rufus Anderson, in his book, History of the Sandwich Island Mission, states, missionaries declare that they had never witnessed more earnest, humble, persevering wrestling in prayer than what was exhibited by some of the native Christians at this time. A powerful move of God happened among even the children. Reverend Dwight Baldwin reported how in Lahaina, for a lengthy period of time, that one could scarcely go in any direction in the sugar cane or banana groves without finding these little ones praying and weeping before God. Hawaii had so many converts, it became known as a Christian nation. Though it was the most bloodiest, it was the most successful. And again, it was because the chief would convert and the whole Allen. So you had Allen after Allen after Allen, and it became such a saturated Vashkin of Christianity. I mean, these missionaries would not give up on these chiefs, and these chiefs were evil. I mean, some of the things they did was just un in a despicable, but they would, they would pray. And there was moves of the Holy Spirit revival that would take place. It would change the chief's heart. They would end up, you know, they were prayer people. So they would have one Allen and they go another Allen, another Allen. And that whole area became the strongest Christianity deposit of, you know, missions that, you, that was in history. And, and it left there. It just didn't disappear because they knew how the, then they took the next generation, the next generation. So there's still that strong influence of the missionaries that's still alive after a couple hundred years. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I know you've been encouraged today with Robert Slaird and follow him. Uh, get, dive into these stories. I know you're encouraged when you hear these. Yes, there's good stories. There's bad stories. But this is what, there's something about it, Robert, when, when you listen to this, and the first time I watched your videos a long time ago, I thought, that's amazing. That's encouraging. Even when you find out where maybe they failed or yeah. something went wrong, it helps you know, hey, if God could use them. There's hope for us. There's hope for me. <laughs> yes. And that's what you should take from that. I want to say thank you for watching us. Follow us, RevivalRadioTV.com. And thank you for supporting us here at the Victory Channel. Thank you, Robert. Thank you.